Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at another Ryzen 9000 DDR5 overclock, this time a 2 to 1 mode setup. The hardware I'm using here is a Kingbank 2x16 DDR5 7600CL36 kit. It uses Hynix 16 gigabit ADI memory chips in a single rank configuration and was provided by Kingbank, so big thank you to them for sending over the memory kit. Uh, the motherboard is an Asus Crosshair X870E Hero, which was provided by Asus, so big thank you to them for the motherboard. And the CPU is a Ryzen 9 9950X that I bought, so a big thank you to the channel supporters for funding the purchase of this uh, of the CPU and making videos like this one possible. Um, so that's that. Also, as you can see, I do have a fan uh, for cooling the memory. If you're wondering about how that's held in place, uh, that's like this. So I have these like really tall motherboard standoffs and yeah, just screws down to the motherboard like that. Uh, also, yes, this is an AMD stock cooler fan. Um, so yeah, I think the whole spacing is like 80 millimeters. Um, if you're like thinking of doing the same thing with a different fan. Um, but uh yeah, I haven't, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, like, you have a motherboard, you could just measure it yourself, so, you know, um, yeah, but I think it's 80 millimeters. Anyway, so, yeah, that's the hardware setup, now let's take a look at the, uh, stress test, like, the stability testing and the, and the settings. So, for stability testing, um, 17 hours and 20, all, yeah, like, over 17 hours of Carhu, uh, y Cruncher for almost three hours, Prime 95 for four and a, like, four and a half hours, uh, no errors in hardware info, max memory temperature was just, un like, 39.8 degrees Celsius, so under 40 degrees. Interestingly enough, the memory temperature didn't seemingly bug out on the memory sticks, um, and yeah, like, these, uh, these Kingbank memory sticks, like, the heat sinks on them are pretty substantial, um, cause I do have the fan maxed out, but as you probably saw, like, you can see from this photo, this fan blade shape actually really doesn't move very much air. So even though the fan is running, uh, where is it? Uh, is it under Asus EC? Anyway, the fan speed is maxed out, and it should be, I think, 2600 RPM. But, uh, unfortunately, this fan, like, it really doesn't move very much air, um, even at 2600 RPM. So, because of the, the blade shape. On the flip side, it's also not very loud. Most other fans at 2600 RPM are unbearable to be with. Um, this isn't. So, um, which is why I use it for memory cooling. Because <clears throat> I can just max it out, and it's not super annoying. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, that's sort of the, the memory, well, so, even though that fan doesn't really move that much air, considering the RPM it's at, um, the heat sinks on these memory sticks, um, plus the fact that the AMD memory controller is a bit bandwidth starved from the Infinity fabric side, means that, yeah, the memory temperatures are, uh, really low, even though I'm running, like, 1.6 volts into the sticks. So, uh... Yeah, and it's not like the room temperature is, like, super cold or anything. The room is at a around 20, 22 degrees Celsius throughout testing. Um, and, yeah, so the, the heat sinks on the sticks work well, but also, like, it's an AMD memory controller. It kind of, like, the... It just can't get memory sticks as hot as an Intel memory controller, because, as far as I know, the Intel Infinity Fabric has a pretty hard limit of something around 64 gigabytes per second, which actually for this setup is even lower because I have the Infinity Fabric synchronized to the memory controller. So the latency is good, but the memory bandwidth is uh, not great. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, memory temperatures are really good. Um, and then CPU maxed out at 80, well, 93 degrees Celsius when running Prime 95. Because um, as it's like switching through the workloads, it sometimes really spikes the temperatures quite a bit. Um, max CPU power draw was 200 watts. Um, anyway, so that's kind of that for the, like, hardware info stats. Now, uh, we already went over, yeah, so Y Cruncher, Prime 95. Also, here you can see the SPD for the, the memory kit. Um, funnily enough, it does come with an Expo 7600 profile, but, um, I mean, that does work. And, in fact, it'll work on quite a few motherboards. It's just... 
Expo 7600 is, in terms of performance, not great. Like, as, like if you tune 7600 manually, it'll be competitive with, like, 6200, depending on the workload. Like, some things will uh, run better at 6200 one-to-one mode. Some things will run better at 7600 uh, two-to-one mode. But generally speaking, and that doesn't just mean, like, like workstation apps work better with two-to-one mode. Like, there are games that actually run better on two-to-one mode. Um, but, yeah, 7600 is, like, the, the starting point where two-to-one mode kind of starts making sense. Um, 7800 in terms of performance is a bit like, you know, approaching the performance of like a 6400 one-to-one mode setup. However, uh, two-to-one mode has one sort of funny, well, sort of two funny benefits compared to -to one-to-one mode. For one thing, you can synchronize the Infinity Fabric to the memory controller, so there's a latency benefit to that. Um, And another thing is you can run incredibly low SOC voltages. Uh, Now, this kind of depends on what kind of Infinity Fabric speed you're planning to run. So, I think for 2200, a lot of CPUs might actually need something around 1.1 volts SoC. Um, But that's still significantly less SoC voltage than the 1.2 volts to 1.3 volts that you'll generally use with 1 to 1 mode. Um, And the side effect of that is that your SoC power draw is significantly lower, which means uh, for, you know, workloads that are power limited... Um, two to one mode actually has like a, can have a performance advantage just because it takes less power away from the CPU's power budget. Um, but this is entirely dependent on you actually manually tuning two to one mode because for example, this motherboard defaults to 1.3 volts SOC in two to one mode, which is ridiculous. Like there for two to one mode, there is really as far as I'm aware, like never a reason for it to be in one point to be at 1.3 volts SOC because your memory controller isn't running that high uh, of a clock, and that's where the SOC voltage requirements really come from in one-to-one mode. Is when you want to run the memory controller at like three gigahertz, it needs a lot more voltage than you know 1950 megahertz. Um, also, at this point, you might be wondering why is this 7800 and not 8000. Uh, That's really simple. This CPU just refuses to function at DDR5-8000. There's, like, I've tried a bunch of stuff, and no matter what I do, it just reboots or errors out. It just isn't stable at DDR5-8000. So, yeah, that's that's that. Like, there's just nothing I can do about it. It doesn't work at DDR5-8000. I've tried a few different boards. I've tried a bunch of different memory kits. Nothing I've done has has helped um, at 8,000. Now, I'm honestly kind of surprised that it's so stable at 7,800, which really makes me think that this memory controller just actually doesn't work at 8,000 because it's it's really, like, with how bad it is at 8,000, you would have, like, I thought, like, oh, 7,800 is going to be, like, a massive pain to set up. But uh, actually, 7800, like, setting up 7800 on this motherboard really wasn't much of a problem once I decided to give up on CL32. Because, yeah, CL32 at 7800 requires a lot of memory voltage. Um, And I think that was starting to get into, like, the rollover territory for this memory kit. Because, well, I don't think I tried stress testing it at 1.75. But, um, yeah. So, the... This is, like, basically the limits of the CPU's memory controller for 2-to-1 mode, as as far as I can tell. Um, and so, performance-wise, does this make sense? I mean, on this CPU, I'd say no, because this CPU works at one... Like, it does 1-to-1 one mode 6400 at, like, 1.22 volts on the SoC. Which, admittedly, yeah, it's going to have high, higher idle power consumption, um, higher like, less power available for the CPU when running CPU workloads. But, uh, ultimately, I don't really see that as too much of a problem. Um, because, yeah, like, 6400 is just going to be generally faster than 7800. Um, but if you have a weak CPU that, like, doesn't do 6400, then 7800, like, a 7800 setup like this actually makes sense because uh even 7600 is actually competitive with 6200 so 7800 
um, depending on your motherboard and your memory kit, might not be that much trouble to set up. And maybe your CPU is better than mine, in which case you can just go straight to 8000, and that's definitely better than 6200, and even like competitive with 6400 in terms of performance. It's just I can't get 8000 to work on this CPU at all, so that's not an option. Um, so, yeah. Um, so that's, that's how I ended up at, you know, 7,800. Also, you might be, th like, some people have pointed this out in the past with, uh, well, 9,000 series CPUs on Asus motherboards, which is that, uh, proc ODT gets set really, really high. This is, like, an Asus thing, and changing this is bad. Like, I tried knocking this down to, like, 48 ohm termination. It doesn't post. So, evidently, uh, Asus has tuned the BIOS on their motherboards for 9000 series to run very high uh, proc ODT. Um, and yeah, and it works, and I really don't see any issue with this. Um, like, my immediate reaction to seeing such a high proc ODT was that, oh, this is going to have, like, reflection issues or something. But evidently it doesn't, because it's stable. If it wasn't, like, if it had actual, like, major problems with, like, signal reflections, it wouldn't be stable. So, um... Yeah, I really don't see any reason to be concerned about that. If, like, because I, like, I saw somebody say that it would, like, cause the memory to pull more power, but that doesn't actually make any sense, because this, this resistor is just, like, th this is, like, this resistor connects between, and for DDR5, this is, there, like, this is just a resistor at the end of the, the signal connection, and so the higher the resistance, the less current it'll actually pull. Um, so... Yeah, really, really no reason to be worried about that. Just kind of weird to, to see that, because, yeah. Um, normally, like, normally Ryzen CPUs use, like, 48 ohm termination, at least for 7000 series. But uh, apparently, for 9000 series, Asus is tuning for 160 ohm proc ODT. So, um, that's kind of that. Um, and, yeah, so that's, that's two to one mode on this board. Um, and I guess we'll go take a look at the BIOS settings at this point, because, uh, like, you can already see the timings, but, yeah, um, am I forgetting anything? Nah, not really. So, basically, the two-to-one mode is a good alternative, like, the thing is, I see a lot of people just saying that, like, one-to-one -one mode is always better than two-to-one mode. That's just not true. It's just that two-to-one mode can require significantly w more work to set up, depending on your motherboard. So, um, yeah, that's, um, but then, like, the potential upsides is, like, even if you get, like, 8,000 working, um, you can still get away with very low SOC voltage, right? So, you always have that, like, low SOC voltage advantage when running two-to-one mode, um, compared to one-to-one. Though, I still think, if you want to, like, not spend a bunch of time tuning your memory, then 1 to 1 mode 6200 is, like, the best option. Because there's very... Like, I mean, I have seen CPUs that can't even do 6200 in 1 to 1, but they're very rare. So, as you can see, the system did just fast boot. Um, that doesn't seem to be causing any issues. Um, and I didn't actually run into, like, any weird retrain instability as I was setting this up. Like, you know, any adjustment I made, like, the stability was, like, the results I was seeing were making sense throughout the tuning process. So, now, the first thing I want to address is getting the FCLK to synchronize to DDR5-7800, because it's kind of awkward, right? Like, you might think, oh, I just set my FCLK over here to 1950. Well, um, no, you don't, because there isn't a 90, 1950 ratio. So how do you get the Infinity Fabric synchronized to 7800? Well, you go into the Advanced menu, AMD Overclocking, and then you accept that, um, which is kind of funny that this is, like, technically just, like, another sub-menu. But anyway, so you hit accept on that, then infinity fabric, infinity fabric, and then here you actually have, like, a very, 
like there is a lot of FCLK ratios. There's like a 1950, 1960. I don't know what that would even line up with, but it exists. I mean, I don't know what 1966 is supposed to line up with either, and that exists too. Um, yeah, but then you get 2000, 2033, 2067, 2100. It's honestly kind of... Um, like, looking at this, it's a bit unfortunate that we don't have, like, a 2025 and a 2050 ratio. Because if you're running, like, 8200, um, yeah, 8200 would be synchronized to 2050. And 8100 would be, like, 2025. Um, and there's no synchronization for either of those, unfortunately. Um, whereas, like, 8400, you can synchronize to 2100, but good luck getting 8400 to work. And then 8,000 synchronizes nicely to 2,000. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of funny. Though I think if you're at 8,200 or 8,100, you might be just fine just running 2,200 FCLK. Um, that's the other way of doing things, because, like, yeah, there's a, there's a latency improvement for synchronizing the Infinity Fabric and the uh, memory controller. But also, you can just kind of brute force, brute force pass that latency benefit with just very high FCLK. Um, and in 2 to 1 mode, since the SOC voltage is so low, it's kind of unlikely that you're going to have major stability issues. But again, verifying stability with high F, like high FCLKs is kind of annoying. Um, whereas like 2000 is, I mean, in my experience, anything under 2100 is basically guaranteed to work. Like 2133, 2166, 2200, 2233, that's where things start getting iffy. And 2200 and 2233 especially, like, well, 2233 basically doesn't work on most CPUs. And 2200 on some chips can be very situational or not work. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, um, since for this setup, like, I really wanted to... Like, I really wanted to experiment with, like, a really low SOC voltage setup here, so that's all the other reason that I really, like, decided to go with, like, 1950 synchronized Infinity Fabric. Because if you go up to, like, 2200, um, which at 7800 is not, for gaming, isn't generally optimal because of the latency penalty. Like, for something like Wycruncher, it does give you a bunch of extra memory bandwidth, but from a, like, gaming perspective, you actually want your Infinity Fabric synchronized when, when you're at DDR5 7800. Um, which makes it really unfortunate that in the Extreme Tweaker menu, the 1950 ratio just isn't available. Um, but yeah, once like I think at like 8100 or something, you'd really want to be going for like 2200 FCLK. But anyway, so that's the Infinity Fabric setting, which, uh, yeah, um, We'll just go through how to get there again, right? So you go to the advanced menu at the very bottom, AMD overclocking, accept, and then here. So not super hard to get through. Also, it's nice that like Asus remembers your selection throughout the menus. Um, but it is a bit annoying that it's not just in the main page. But that is standard for most motherboards. And at least on Asus... Uh, overriding the FCLK in the AMD overclocking menu works properly because I've run into other motherboards where you try to override it and they're just stuck at 2000, which is super annoying. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, SOC voltage at 0 0.9 volts because 2 to 1 mode is just cool like that. Uh, VDDIO at 1.45, Asus board things, they like really high VDDIO. So, um, yeah, um, so that's that's why that's at 1.45, VDDP at 1.05, uh, I, well, I haven't messed around with, like, raising VDDP up and down at 7800, but I did at 8000, and for 8000, as unstable as 8000 with this CPU is, 1.05 was the least unstable, um, so probably optimal for 7800 as well, and then VDD 1.6 volts, this might be a bit high, um, I don't think CL34 necessarily requires 1.6 volts, but also I'm lazy and the memory temperatures aren't bad, so... No, I don't see any reason to minimize that. And then VDDQ at 1.4. Uh, this is, again, uh, like a leftover from the 8000 testing that I was doing. 1.4 worked best at 8000. As little as 8000 did work, but this was kind of the best option for, for 8000. So I've just kind of left that in place. Um, I didn't check if, like, 1.35 or 
like the thing is this is already stable so it's i can't even like check if it's like better because like w like what's it gonna do um so yeah 1.4 vddq it is um and then i didn't need to mess with the vddg or uh yeah i didn't mess with the vddg voltages you could potentially, like, I'm not sure what ASUS is defaulting them to, because they don't read out in any software, but, uh, or at least in none of the software I checked, tried checking with. They might, might read out in Ryzen Master, um, but I really don't like using Ryzen Master, so. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, if you wanted to, like, further optimize your SOC power consumption, minimizing these, uh, is an option, and if you're only running, like, 1950 FCLK, you might be able to run this at, like, 700 millivolts or something. Um, though, obviously, the, the potential issue with minimizing your VDDGs is if that you desta destabilize the Infinity Fabric, the symptoms of that are not necessarily that the system crashes, it's that you get, like, random stutters, audio cuts, and just, you know, other annoyance, because... The Infinity Fabric has um, some pretty intense error correction on it to, like, really minimize the chances of it crashing the system, um, which makes stress testing it really annoying. Anyway, let's go through the memory timings. So, TCL34. I really wanted to set up CL32, but that just seems to require too much voltage for this to work. TRCD46, TRP at 36. Um, this might even work at 34... Um, but that was one of the, like, I was, like, a lot of the initial setup for this overclock was I was really trying to run these, like, the primaries as low as possible, and that, that was, like, giving me issues where it would, like, error out, like, three hours into a test, which I eventually gave up on, so, um, yeah, the TRP might not necessarily, like, because the thing is with ADI, a lot of the time your TRP will actually, well, it'll be, like, it could be the same as TCL, or it'll be like a couple ticks above it. So this is a couple ticks above it. So um, this might be minimized, but not, you know, and it also TRP kind of varies by memory kit. So um, yeah, then TRAS, I didn't try to minimize TRAS. Um, so this might go lower. Um, but yeah, I just left it at 48, TRC at 84. Um, I actually did try, well, no, that's not true. I did try pushing TRC to, like, 78 or something through a combination of, like, TRP and TRAS adjustment. Um, though I was also, I think that was still with CL32 on, so, yeah. Luckily, these two timings don't matter that much from a performance perspective, so, yeah. Um, anyway, so, basically, TRP, TRAS, TRC, not necessarily minimize. TCL is, um, TRCD might work at 45, um, I'm relatively certain that 44 doesn't work. Anyway, <clears throat> TWR, 48, um, it, it doesn't go lower than that, um, refresh interval completely maxed out. One of the funny benefits of very high memory clocks is that your refresh interval, well, it's not really a benefit, but your refresh interval effectively gets shorter as your memory clock increases. So, um, like, if you can run 65,000 at DDR5-6000, you can basically definitely run 65,000 at, like, 7800, because at 7800, 65,000 is actually less time between refreshes. Then for TRFC, 512, this could go a bit lower, but I'm not, you know, like, I'm not really big on minimizing TRFC, especially when your refresh interval is maxed out, because... Like, let's say, you know, like, I think usually for 7,800, a lot of people would use, like, 40, 480. Um, and the thing is, with 65,000 refresh interval, it's, like, 0.7% versus my 512 divided by... It's also, like, 0.7%, okay? So, it's, like... It's like 0.05% difference between refresh intervals, which is like, nah. That just actually doesn't matter. Um, RTP at 12. I was messing with 8, but I'm pretty sure that was causing the system to not post. TRDL and S at 8. Um, I think... Uh, so, I haven't verified this myself, but I have heard that like TRDL and TRDS in 2 to 1 mode, you actually can't set them below 8. 
it just doesn't do anything. Um, and also with DDR5, the burst length is eight clock cycles. So even in one-to-one -one mode, setting TRDL and TRDS below eight, um, it has like very negligible performance gains. Like, it's, yeah. So, so for two-to-one mode, I definitely don't like th this. Really, is, in two-to-one mode, this really isn't a problem. And in one-to-one -one mode, it's like, well, if you have M die, I guess you'd end up running something like this. Anyway. TWR, TR, uh, WTRL, and WTRS at 16 at 4, which is really low. Um, so, uh, yeah. SCL, read-to-read -read SCL is 8. I did actually try 7. It was very unstable, so that doesn't work. Um, and write-to-write -write at 8. Um, now, write-to-write, -write, you could set it to 1, but I suspect the reason you can do that is because it's like, doesn't, it isn't, a like, a thing. Like, I don't think the memory controller is ignoring it so much as, like, the memory controller doesn't get enough write requests to actually need to use it when it's one. Um, so, yeah, and then we have WRD at 4 and TRDWR at 20. Um, so, this might go lower. Like, you might be able to run lower TRDWR than this, but I, like, and I did experiment with that, but I was running, like, I did want to get this set up somewhat soon-ish, so... Um, yeah, like, I was testing, like, 18, and I eventually just gave up on that, because, like, I gave up on a few things at the same time, so it might not have been the issue, but it was just like, look, I just want to eliminate variables and get this working as soon as possible. Um, also, this isn't going to get much lower, like, I don't think it's going to ever, like, I'm, I don't think it's going to work at 16. Um, I was mainly trying to get it to, like, work at 18, and wasn't having much success with that. Um, anyway, and then the only other thing I've done is set UCLK to MCLK slash um, 2. Also, if you're also on Asus motherboards, you might have noticed that if you try to set, with 9000 series, if you try to set the on die termination uh, with this setting over here, it doesn't do anything. Um, so the way you have to do it is you have to set it from here. Um, and yeah, I tried setting both of these to 48 and that did not work. Um, even though that's like typical termination for Ryzen 7000. Um, so for 9000 series, Asus is just using 160 ohms and I'm like, it works. So I'm not really going to question it. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's it for this setup. So, I mean, I'm quite disappointed that this, like, 9950X just doesn't work at 8000, especially when it's, like, surprisingly easy to get 7800 working on it, especially on a 4Dimmer. This is actually the first 4Dim motherboard where I've had 7800 work. Uh, also, compared to, like, the Asus 4Dimmers of, like, X670, B650, this thing is a lot better. Like, my X670E Pro, uh, Pro Art, that thing maxes out at, like, 7,400. Um, so, yeah, now I just wish I had a better CPU. Because, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, th this board supposedly can do 8,000, but, um, I've really not had much success with that on this board, even with some of my 7,000 series chips, but I suspect that might just be due to, like, the board not, like, the BIOS not being tuned for 7,000 series. Right, because, like, 9000 series, this board uses, like, 160 ohm proc ODT, whereas 7000 series, it still uses 48 ohms. So, I'm kind of wondering if, like, whatever optimizations Asus made to the BIOS to work with that insanely high proc ODT just aren't there with 7000 series, and so, consequently, 7000 series on this board. I mean, it is better than it was on X670, but it's not, you know, like, those are chips that do do 8000 on other boards, they don't do it here. So, um, yeah. Um, that's kind of that. So, two to one mode, still kind of a gimmick on AM5, in my opinion. Like, as far as like setting this up goes, it's easier than it used to be. Like, way easier. Um,. Would I recommend it to most people? Uh, no. 
Um, cause like, especially if you get as unlucky as I got with this 9950X, it's just not going to work at 8,000, like at all. It just reboots every time I try to run anything. Um, but, um, and so like, like if you just like, yeah, like I'd generally still stick to like 6,200 one-to-one. And if you just want a working expo, I'd buy 6,000 CL30, right? Like 6,000 CL30. If you wanted to be faster, tuning it, tune it up to like 6,200. Um, if you get lucky with your CPU, it might even do 6,400. And two to one mode is kind of like, like, I, like it's viable. Like it's not like it's, you know, and I guess if you really care about your idle power consumption, because yeah, like the, the really low SOC voltage, um, d like that does a lot for your idle power draw and the memory, like the thing is you might be thinking like, oh, the memory power consumption with 1.6 volts, 1. Um, 1.4 has to be insane. Um, it really isn't. Also, uh, if I ditch the CL34, this would probably work at like 1.45 VDD, um, right? If it was CL36 instead, um, though maybe some of the sub timings would also have to get a bit looser. But the other thing is, like, if you're just sitting idle, right, the memory, even with these really high voltages, it doesn't really pull any power. Now, that might also be because I have power down mode enabled. Um, but yeah, like, it's it's like half a watt of power draw on the memory sticks. So that really doesn't seem to be a, like, I don't see that as a problem. So two to one mode is like, it's like, it's viable against one-to-one -one mode. Uh, it has some, like, power efficiency benefits. Um, but it's still high-speed DDR5. It's still not as easy to set up. It's it's easier than it used to be, but, you know, like, this isn't... Um, like, I don't, I don't think this is something I would like... Like, I wouldn't recommend this if you don't want to deal with stability problems, basically. Um, so, yeah, um, but for me, this was also, like, uh, like, I wanted, like, the, the other motivation for this video was, like, I really wanted to know, like, hey, does this, like, nine, this 9950X really doesn't work at 8,000, so I wanted to know, like, hey, does, like, does 7800 work? Like, how bad is it? Um, and, and the answer is, um... I guess not that bad. Like, I don't know. Maybe I like, I don't like the thing is I don't bin CPUs. So I don't know if there's chips out there that can't do, you know, 7,800. Um, but this one definitely can't do 8,000, which was quite a surprise because most of my 7,000 series chips, like stabilizing 8,000 is a pain, but they're more stable than this thing is. Um, so yeah. Um, that's it for the video. Hopefully you found this interesting, if not particularly useful, and um, thanks for watching. Um, yeah, thanks to KingBank and Asus for the memory and motherboard. Thanks to the channel supporters for the CPU. Um, and that's it. So thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon and a uh spring store which i think the link for that is broken uh a band camp there, there's like links in the description you could check them out i'd appreciate that and yeah that's it so thanks for watching and uh goodbye <laughs>